thing. Money makes the world go round, and money, look at, if you look at the money, you understand how the country is organized and where the power is. If the cantons want to do something, the cantons, that's the intermediate level, right? They don't get the money from the national government. They have to turn towards the citizens to get the money. And Mr. Brechtel is the mayor of the city. He will tell you in a moment if he needs money, he can't look upwards. He has to look, he has to go to the citizens and tell them we will do something in the park. Very important. No control, political control. And all the countries participate equally in the decision-making process on national level. The small countries and the large, the huge countries. Very important in federalist countries, the smaller countries, they have more to say than the larger countries. Otherwise, it's not federalism. It's just a simple majoritarian government. Diversity, autonomy is important, and equalization is important. Because we have huge rich cantons and some small cantons which have not the same resources as the huge cantons, the big cantons. So the Small, uh, the rich cantons, they give money to the smaller cantons, or the poorer cantons. That's normal, isn't it? The question is, how do you calculate how much money you have to give? We just had a huge reform on an equalization scheme, which was accepted by the majority of the citizens and the majority of the cantons and the idea is it's not like in Germany everybody the same but it's everybody at least enough to provide all the important services so the equalization is not a hundred percent for all cantons but it is at least 85% for every canton. So the rich cantons, they give money to the poor cantons until they have 85% of the national average. I know I give 300 Swiss francs to a citizen from the canton of Berlin. It's very transparent, it's calculated, and it's accepted. Differences exist, you have to cope with. Well, I could talk to you about history. I'm not, in, but I'm not going to do that to leave room for discussions. What is important is, well, we had here, when we started, a very unequal society at the beginning. We had some cantons in the center which were exploiting the other cantons around them. And of course that's not a good situation for a modern democratic state. And it took us a long time, good ideas from the French Revolution, <coughs> Napoleon helped us, and, 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 we had a civil war, and, and, and. But finally we managed to create a, a nation state based on a constitution and uh, a constitution which was accepted by about 70% of the cantons. That was in 1848. In 1848, we had our first elected government. The problem was, there was a civil war before that, and it was very difficult to kind of have the cantons agree on a central nation state, a more centralized organization. And that's why for us, federalism 
is so important. That was the only solution to bring these different cantons under a common roof. Otherwise, those who were against a national constitution would not have accepted it. <coughs> so it was at that time when we wanted to create a well-functioning nation state where we had to when we had to rely on federalism as a possible solution to our conflict. So the national state was very weak. Didn't have a lot of competences because those who lost the war they would never have accepted a strong nation state. Right? So the canton had in their hands what we call residual competences. The national government can only do what has been delegated from the bottom to the top to the national government. So they don't have all the power. They only have limited power to collect tax money. They can't increase VAT just like they want. They have to ask the people and the country. So the country is built bottom up. And the residual competences are in the hands of the country. That is the important thing about it. We didn't choose just like this. We had to choose federalism. And, I must say, it still functions quite well. We have decentralization in terms of municipalities. We have a lot of municipalities. And the country, the municipalities again, they're quite autonomous. No problem with that. Well, that's the characteristics. I'm going to tell you about the report to show you uh, we did about the, uh, 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 the, the way we well, produce or we put forward to measure autonomy and to show you the differences. Two years ago, the European Commission asked us to measure local autonomy in terms of decentralization. And we won uh, uh, the mandate, and we did a study, a huge study together with experts from 40 countries about. And the idea, why did the uh, European Union give money to Switzerland to study uh, decentralization? The reason was the European Union is interested in the organization of the countries on local level because they have their structural funds and they invest a lot of money to foster economic development in poor countries. And their problem is that a huge part of this money cannot be used because quite a few countries, they don't have politicians on local level, they don't have a structure on local level where they can invest or guarantee that the money they receive is invested the right way. They have a scheme to monitor that and they look at it carefully and if they can't show that they have responsible politicians, they have well-functioning local governments, they don't get the money. And they wanted to kind of monitor the differences in terms of local autonomy. So we developed a scheme to measure local autonomy. I'm not going into the topic, going into the details. Here is the map of local autonomy. And here is the ranking. From the experts, we asked, we came to these results. Here, the countries with the lowest degree of decentralization. Here is the Ukraine. There are some other countries that are less decentralized, but the municipalities have less autonomy. And here is, here are the countries 
where the local autonomy, where decentralization is very important. The local politicians have a lot to say. Switzerland is here, in this rank, it's here. But here are the Scandinavian countries. Switzerland, then you have Poland, Norway, for example, Italy. Now, of course, now you may ask the question, so what? Is decentralization a good thing or not? We try to test it rather quick and dirty, but nevertheless. If you look at the correlations, the relation between local autonomy here on this scale and decentral uh, uh, and economic growth on this scale, you realize there is a positive correlation. If you look at local autonomy and corruption, that's the perceived corruption index, perhaps you know that one, uh, which is uh, uh, well, brought forward by Transparency uh, International. You see, the more autonomous municipalities are, the lower or the, the idea or the lower the degree of corruption. It's an inverse uh, scale. You can, can do the same with democracy and you can do the same even with happiness. The more autonomous municipalities are, according to the World Happiness Index, the happier or the people. I said quick and dirty. Causality is always a problem if you look at correlations. So just to decentralize municipalities, to give power to the municipalities, doesn't necessarily mean that people get happy. You need politicians to well, fulfill these promises, of course. And you need citizens to participate in local politics, which is not always that easy. If you look at the countries up here, you always find the same suspect. You find countries like the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Sweden, Finland sometimes, Iceland, Norway, Switzerland. So the rich countries, the smaller countries, they perform quite well. The successful countries, however, they are decentralized. And the question is, to what extent you can move into such a direction? But I'm convinced decentralization helps. So, how much time do I have left? <laughs> Okay. So two more things. Now we had federalism, pillar one. I talked to you about pillar two and three, or about pillar three and pillar two. Pillar two or three, direct democracy. That's what we are famous for, like chocolate. For example, no other country practices direct democracy as we do in Switzerland. We have some countries where citizens gather once in a year on a square to decide on cantonal issues. They just go there, the government reposes, everybody has the possibility to speak up, and then at the end, well, you want to amalgamate municipalities in your country, in, in this country, and if the citizens say yes, okay, they amalgamate. If somebody suggests you want to lower the age 
the uh, voting age to 16, and the citizens accept, you lower the age to 16. Very simple, not very expensive, in this area is very, very popular. Lots of tourists coming to these places and both have a mental position. Those are exceptions on But we have the same on local level, in municipalities. If the municipalities are about 20,000 inhabitants, sometimes you have a parliament, but sometimes you have a local assembly, municipal assembly, two, three, four times a year, citizens gather here to make decisions. Local parliament, there you have parties, that's a bit of a different story, but this direct democracy is quite interesting and it works quite well. About 80 percent of the municipalities have these citizen meetings to make up the most important decisions. They discuss about budget, expenditures, important projects, land use, zoning, rules, regulation. Everything is decided by the citizens. And this is very important. They decide on the budget, on the money they spend. Their authority spend. Why? Because they give them the money. In terms of tax. So if I can pay tax to my local government, I want to know what it does with my money. And if my local government spends a lot of money, I know next year they come back to me and ask for more tax money. So I look very careful what they do. <laughs> Sorry. Perhaps better known is direct democracy on national level when we vote. A lot of issues we vote, we vote compulsory on the local court, on public, uh, uh, on important public expenditure. That's now from the city of Syria. That's where I live. If the city government wants a new state, wants to build a new stadium, they need money. So they have to ask me whether I agree or not, because they spend my money. Uh, pu important public expenditure, there are optional referendums. If they do things some groups in the city don't accept, they can collect signatures. And if they collect enough signatures, then there is a vote. And we have an initiative. If the group wants to change something, they think we should have more uh, pistes for bicycles, for example. They propose this. If they have enough signatures, then citizens decide, and they say, well, Let's do more for bicycles. And if the citizens decide these decisions are compulsory, government has to do it. It's not up to them. It's not an opinion poll. It's just the citizens decided that they have to do it. And the citizens decide very carefully because they know they have to pay for it. So they are not just wishes. These are responsible decisions because they have consequences. Well, there's not more to be said about this. I skipped that because I wanted to show. Uh, uh, I want to show you the last pillar. That's actually that's my favorite. It is power sharing in government. Nobody understands that because it's completely clear if you compare to other countries. So. Well, we don't have a presidential, we always have hybrid solutions. We don't put all eggs into one basket, it's too dangerous. So we have a bit of this, we have a bit of that. That's the government we have. That's the parties which are represented in government. At the beginning, we only had one party. That's not very nice. Now we have all the important parties in government. We had some problems with the anti-immigration party, but for about 40 years we had the same composition of uh, parties in government. 
And this compensation was guaranteed on a voluntary basis. Because the party thought, well, that's a good thing if we share power, if we share responsibilities. That's our government. We don't have 20 or 30 ministers. Uh, too expensive. We have seven. That's enough. And we have the chancellor, that's number eight. So we have seven. They have to be close to the people. Right? We don't give them cars. Well, they have access to drivers, but well, it's not like the French president and the French ministers, they have their own chief and all that kind of stuff. We kind of try to keep them modest. Right? And we don't have the president. It's too dangerous. It's concentrating power. So our presidency changes from year to year. And people usually don't know who is president at the moment. Do you know? one in the middle. But next year is going to be. Madame Leuka. And then the year after. So whenever a foreign politician comes to Switzerland, comes to Switzerland, the first question is, who is your president nowadays or today? Because every year it changes. We had this, we started the government like this in 150 years ago, and we still have it that way. And it functions. We always have the government. They are from different parties. They have to compromise. They have to find solution, solutions for the whole country and not for their party only. <coughs> So there's a lot of consensus seeking going on in order to bring or to agree on a common program. But it's from issue to another. It's not like in coalition governments where they start decide prior do we have do we get a majority in party and then they go together for four years and the smaller parties are trying to get as much as they can out of the coalition government. It's just that they have to run the country together. That's what we expect from them. And they are not that important. That our government, because they use our money to do their job. That's about the idea. We have this on national level, and <laughs> my colleague will tell you that he has the same problem. Well, he's a mayor, he has a bit more to say than the president, but nevertheless, he has to kind of find compromises with his colleagues. <coughs> okay, so that was about what I wanted to tell you about the political institutions, which are the basic cornerstone of our success, and which contain three pillars, federalism, consensual, democracy and direct democracy and the principle behind it is power sharing don't let nobody get too powerful and try to keep politicians close to the citizens thank you